Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm pleased Margaret Purvis is able to join us today. She is the CEO and president of the Food Bank for New York City, the city's major hunger relief organization. So you can imagine how busy she is these days and how needed her organization is right now, as if it wasn't before Hurricane Sandy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Tell us something about the history of the Food Bank, how, how it got started and why. Well, the Food Bank was started in 1983. Um, you know, we are we're in an odd situation in that we actually were founded, we were founded by one of our members, uh, Kathy Goldman, who is a legend in uh, uh, community uh, circles. She started it because she realized she was already running a program and feeding uh, homeless men and realized there had to be a better way to get food. So she heard about a food bank. She said she had no idea uh, how one would get it started. So she got a a letter from a 25-year-old person who had just graduated from school. Her name was Liz Kruger, uh, who we all now know as Senator Liz Kruger. Mm -hmm. She was actually the first staff member of the food bank. Okay. Um, they started in a very organic way. Uh, the first year of our uh, of our creation, we were we took 500,000 pounds of food, and we had 95 member agencies. Uh, and today, we now do 74 million pounds of food every year uh, to more than a thousand charities. Okay. Um, and I gather that your mission is basically to serve as a conduit to get the food to the many organizations that operate food kitchens and food pantries. Absolutely. And you say there are about 1,000 organizations who do that now? Yes. Are they mostly religious organizations? You don't end hunger without faith-based organizations. They make up about 75 to 80 percent of our network. Uh, and they are almost 95 percent of the emergency food network food programs. You know, when people see a food bank, they think soup kitchen and food pantry, but they should know that we also have schools as members. We have rehab centers, domestic violence shelters, uh, regular family transitional housing. Pretty much anybody that's out there ensuring that the neediest New Yorkers get food, they're probably a food bank member. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where do you get the food from? Is it delivered to you and then you deliver it to the the pantries and the soup kitchens, or do you simply act as a mediator to get it from the suppliers to the to the members? All of that. Uh, we, when we initially started, we were just trying to be a place so that you know companies that were going to get rid of wasted food. You know, back in the day, in the 80s, we would burn food. Well, now because of modern technology, there's not a lot of food that's being wasted. So we still get food that's donated from corporations, but we now have commodities that come in from the federal government. We have food that comes in from the state. New York City is very special in that we're the only city uh, in America that actually has a city program okay. um, that also provides food. And then whatever's still not there, we also have to purchase quite a lot of food um, just to supplement it because New York City is very different in that we make sure that there's something for everyone. Uh, no one else has a kosher community or, um, with special dietary needs like we do or having a halal community and we make sure that there's food there for everyone. Now do you also get the food from from restaurants or is that some another no, program? No, that's called food rescue. We don't okay. rescue food. We do commodities that we deliver to our member agencies in bulk. Okay. And they use that to make meals for their clients. Now you have uh, you have three main sites and then you have another 14 sites for helping with tax preparation. It sounds like a re when you got a thousand sites. Yeah. It sounds like um, a very complicated task, routing food from so many donors to so many soup kitchens and pantries, making sure that perishable food gets distributed before it goes bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would seem that this would require an army of administrators, <laughs> record keepers, food handlers, truck drivers, does it? it? There's about 150 staff members at the food bank. Okay. A lot of people behind the scenes, but I think more than just the bodies that we have today, we have a 30 year history of knowing how to get this work done. Um, we have people who purchase the food. We have people who working in the warehouse that's pulling the food. But in the past few years, we've also changed a lot of our mission where it's not just about food. We are very unique in that we are a food bank that also has our own soup kitchen and pantry, and that informs our work. And that's in Harlem? That is in Harlem. Where, where in Harlem? It is on 116th Street and Frederick Douglass. Um, and we are proudly serving that community, but that really informs what we do around the city. 
So because we took that program over, we were able to then extend ourselves to the citywide network. We now also provide food stamp outreach and nutrition education and a tax program. We do that because we can't end hunger just with food. We knew that we had to also go beyond that to make sure that we had enough uh, things that would allow us to really address the root causes of hunger, to get cash in people's, in people's hands. Because there is such a stigma still, and stigma is very real, around hunger and food stamps, a lot of times people learn about their eligibility because we'll get them through the tax program. Everybody has to do their taxes. People can come in and not feel ashamed if they're having to walk through a soup kitchen to get their taxes done. But typically, you know, every time we do that, we also check them for eligibility. Okay. We have found that many people were eligible and did not know. Eligible for food stamps. For food stamps, absolutely. Okay. Now, the your 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 soup kitchen in Harlem, how how many days is it open a week? And it's how many it's open every day. Every day? Every Seven day. days a week? Well, no, five days a week. Five days a Work week. Work days. Okay, okay. Um, so... How many people get food through the food bank and its member organizations? I have a figure from your website, 400,000 a day? 400,000 meals per day okay. our network produces, but we serve about 1.5 million New Yorkers every single year. Okay. And we okay. serve them in different ways, but even just for that tax program I was telling you, every year we return $65 million in tax refunds to the poorest New Yorkers. So I would assume you're talking in a lot, a lot of cases about the earned income tax credit? Absolutely. Okay, yes. okay, which is for working families, okay, with children, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I would think I have heard that the need for food, uh, free food, has grown in recent years. By how, by how much? You know, we already, just in 2007, we did a study. And at that time, we had about 47% of our member agencies were saying that they didn't have enough food. That they were running they out? Were running out of food to distribute to people. We've now seen more than a 25% increase, and now about 65% of our member agencies are saying that they are running out of food. You know, people, we are now not talking about homeless. When I was talking to uh, Carla Harris, who's one of our board members, she's been on board for a very long time, and she told me, she says, Margaret, when we started this thing, we thought we were going to be out of business in about you know, five, ten years. We'll be done. At that time, everyone was focused on homeless men. Soup kitchens now serve over 400,000 children every year. I mean, this really is a safety net that's catching people when they are dealing with personal emergencies. Um, you know, when we look at Sandy, you know, we had a dinner at Cipriani Wall Street the day before Thanksgiving. We wanted to be able to... Um, bring, give people a reprieve. We sent 16 buses out to the hardest hit communities from Staten Island, Far Rockaway, Red Hook, Coney Island. And what we kept hearing over and over again from family member after family member was, I have never been on this side of giving. I write checks. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I provide clothes. I think that more and more New, York, New Yorkers have seen the real value of having emergency feeding programs in your community that are there to serve every one. So how do, uh, it was interesting that your recent study showed that the actual number of food pantries and soup has declined. Absolutely. E even in the face of increasing need. Why is that? Well, the recession. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned before, most of the programs are run out of faith-based organizations. The places where we've seen the biggest hits have been Harlem, the Bronx, uh, Central Brooklyn. As people are struggling, that means there's less money going into the collection plate at faith houses. That means that they have to make decisions, and many of them have had to make the decision to close the programs. Right. The other thing is, you know, we provide them with food, but, th but these programs still have to raise their own money. They still have to put some in, and if you have so much less, they're ma they can't make that decision to put out what they don't have. So people who, and your own recent study found that 2.9 million New Yorkers are having some trouble affording food. So what do they do? <sighs> well, they try to find their, their closest member agency to support them. They get on food stamps. Um, Maybe eat less. They eat less. I mean, we definitely saw that even for veterans, 25% of them were saying that they are eating less, and another 25% were saying that they're relying on family members. This is a big deal. We like to look at the veteran number because, you know, when we look at the military for impoverished families, you know this, a military is supposed to be the way out. You know, if you weren't, if you didn't get to go to college or whatever, you go out, you serve your, you serve your country, but you're also serving your family. That money that came in from the military 
is a major big deal for a lot of poor families. For those men and women to return and there's no jobs and they are struggling, that really talks about a very serious situation that's happening for poor families where the military was supposed to be a lifeline and is not panning mm -hmm. out that way when they mm -hmm. come home. What's the difference between a, um, a soup kitchen and a, and a food pantry? A soup kitchen is all about a prepared hot meal. You eat it there on the spot and then you go away. A pantry is sort of like a grocery store in that you're going to get a set amount of food based on the size of your family. We typically will make sure that you get up to three meals, I mean, th I'm sorry, three meals a day for three days. For That's everybody in the family. For every person in the family. Um, what we're now seeing, one of the big changes that we've noticed is that more and more soup kitchens, ours included, is now also doing a takeaway meal. Because what we found is that specifically people, the seniors and people with small children, they won't eat the meal there. They're already trying to put it in Tupperware because they're wanting to make sure they have something for later. Mm -hmm. So we now have set a policy that you get a meal now and then we also make sure you get something to take with you so that you actually will go ahead and I eat. see. Now in the, with the food pantries, um, what kind of food do they get? I, I would imagine there'd be a lot of carbs, a lot of canned food, but you're also, I, I was reading that there's more fresh food and vegetables. Does that go yes. into the, the grocery carts? You Absolutely. Say? You okay. know, I'll tell you, back in the day, it was, you know, you never really knew what you were going to get because we weren't really purchasing food. It was about whatever came in. So you could get Twinkies or all kinds of things like that. You never knew. You just never knew. Mm -hmm. Whatever came in, we'd have to give it out because that's what we had. Right. We now have a greater ability to have more control over the food. So we actually don't distribute, uh, you know, the sweets and the things of that nature. So it's actually really good, solid food. Protein is our number one thing that we are distributing. Is there meat? Do you give away Oh, meat? absolutely. Oh, we have from meat and tuna and produce is our number one item. New Food Bank for New York City is the largest distributor of free produce in the country. Mm -hmm. um, millions of pounds of food because for the communities, everything that we do, it has to be based in reality. You know, we're not just here to end hunger, we're here to end hunger with dignity. And you, in order to do that, you have to base it on real-time information of what does poverty look like and feel like really. And most of the people that we're serving, they're living in food deserts. And produce is the most expensive thing for them. So we know that people are going to try to stretch those benefits. And the thing that most people will cut will be the produce. Because in poorer communities, produce costs more money. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why we push so much to get it out there. And for places like Brooklyn, we actually have seen a huge uptick because one of the fastest growing groups are Asian American seniors in central Brooklyn. But they're not going to eat canned goods. They want the fresh produce. You know, people still, wherever you go, you're still going to take your dietary right, lifestyle. Right. Um, they're not going to eat things that are filled with sodium and things of that nature. So the produce has actually become the most popular items I see. that we have because okay. they're the most expensive out there. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Margaret Purvis, CEO and President of the Food Bank for New York City right after this message. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY leads. CUNY leads to the career I always wanted. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Margaret Purvis, CEO and President of the Food Bank for New York City. Who qualifies for food from the pantries or the soup kitchens? I mean, is it, is it an economic test, and who makes the decision about who qualifies? Yes, um, it is based on economics, obviously, and needs. Um, for, to get food from us, you have to be able to reach um, 185 percent of poverty. So for a family of three, that will be $35,000. But for food stamps, you have to reach 130 percent of poverty. So for a family of three, that's going to end up being about 25, no, yeah, $25,000. Okay. And so we make sure that even if most people that come in, if people express a need, no one is coming to pantries for their health. 
Um, so most people who come there are absolutely eligible. We're not turning people away um, if they're coming and expressing a need, um, especially for Hurricane Sandy, where a person's salary on paper uh, would be one thing. But if you are in a home that had no electricity um, and you've continue to be without electricity and your food has all gone bad, of course you are going to get food and our member agencies have been on the ground since day one ensuring that everyone who needs food is getting food. But for, for your non-Sandy people, they have to show some kind of proof of income. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was interested to to read in your recent report that the overwhelming number of people who staff the uh, the the pantries and the soup kitchens are volunteers yes. and they're not paid staff. Yes. Which really seems to s say something about, you know, uh, the generosity of New Yorkers, mm -hmm. that you can find enough people to staff these places, you know, that run on a regular basis all year round. Yes, it does. I mean, one of the things about, you know, the disaster, everyone talks about the debris from a disaster, but I tell you, the overwhelming goodness just found in your average New Yorker, your average neighbor. It really is um, a daily blessing to be able to see. However, I will tell you, the programs who are able to be the most nimble, the ones who are able to provide more than food, food stamp outreach, taxes, uh, counseling services, uh, job referrals, training referrals, those are programs who have staff members. Okay. Um, there is a need for investment on the ground in order for them to go beyond just handing a bag of food. Um, I would imagine that the people who people who are in need, you know, because you know, I see various evidence. People lined up outside of various uh, food pantries and soup kitchens around the city. Uh, you know, some are open one day a week. Some are open two or three days a week. Some offer lunch. Some offer on a certain day. Some offer dinner. Yes. I would imagine that people who are in need would learn the schedules of the various organizations and what's available and. Without you know, doubt. use that to go to different places? Without to... a doubt. I mean, we have found that on our website, our most popular page is our food locator. Um, it's where people are looking for food. They're looking for food at certain times. They're looking for food after work. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, the biggest misconception is that, you know, people are just hanging around in the house waiting for the pantry to open. The majority of people that we serve, the large majority, they are the working poor. People have, and not just working, they typically are having more than one job. Okay. Um, so, so they absolutely are always looking for more options. And specifically, programs that are open on the weekends and programs that are open at night are what we hear the most requests for. Mm -hmm. How is the food bank funded? Food bank has many different avenues for funding. I mean, uh, always government, federal, state, and local. Is that um, the largest chunk of your funding? It, for years, it has always been. For this past year, we're quite proud of the fact that it's been our first time ever getting more funding from private sources than government, um, which is something that we've worked very hard for. Uh, we also get, obviously, money for, from corporations and foundations. So it really is, we're very, we're very lucky to be able to have a very mixed bag of funding. And I say lucky in the sense that, you know, in the past, when we, the food bank first started, it was absolutely um, just based on so few individuals giving, you know, relatively small gifts. Um, and at that time, we were not delivering food. Member agencies used to have to come to the warehouse in Hunts Point to pick up their food, which mm -hmm. also meant we couldn't really go to scale in the way that we can now. Right. No one picks up from the food bank now. We are 100% delivery You operation. have your own trucks that take We them have trucks <laughs> that are on the road every single day. They are they get on the road at about 7 o'clock in the morning every day and don't come back and till uh, close to 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening. Tell me about your nutrition education program. Ah, we love our nutrition education program. And nutrition education is one of our, we call it a three-pronged approach to ending hunger. We are proud about, of that because nutrition education is that kind of thing that no one was really talking about. Um, that it's not just about food access, but one part of access is about education and knowledge and dealing with the issues of distaste. Um, so we decided to first, the first part of our nutrition education was geared at training soup kitchen and pantry managers to make them know what they should put in the bags, that it matters, that you don't want to just fill it up so it can be, you know, a nice full bag, but are you thinking meals? Did you include any fresh produce? When you're selecting items, are you looking at the sodium content? 
because we have to look at the entire person, the entire community, where heart disease, um, uh, diabetes, all these other issues are really killing communities that are also dealing with poverty. So we're really proud of the fact that we have a regular and robust training program for soup kitchen managers. About four years ago, we then had another opportunity when we took over the soup kitchen and pantry in Harlem. We're now able to do a program called Cook Shop, where we are inside of New York City Public Schools providing nutrition education to children and their parents. There are 40,000 kids who are inside of that program. We provide all the curriculum, we provide the food for the teachers, and they actually work it into their day-to-day -day curriculum. We train the teachers, um, they have their own networks, we have different incentives for them so that people can really get excited about healthy eating. We want to make sure healthy eating is cool. Um, that We do that for smaller children, but we also have a program called Eat Wise. And it's become my favorite because we're focusing on teenagers. You know, by the time kids get to, you know, same kids who could have been totally eligible for free and reduced lunch in elementary, something happens when they get to, to junior high and high school. Mostly it's a stigma of being a part of the, of the free lunch program because it's separate and people know. You can be in a school where 95% of the kids are eligible, but still they're not eating. Mm -hmm. The usage rate drops very low. So what are they buying, pizza and uh, burgers? No, many of them are not eating. Really? They're not eating. So we decided to do the <clears throat> Eat Wise program and to really make it robust, and we're actually about to launch a new website so that we can use peer educators, other teenagers, who will get to the point about, you know, why you want to take care of your body and how all of your the things you're planning for yourself, they're all based on a healthy diet today. Um, all the things that you want to do as far as being an athlete, you must be healthy. You must have something beyond snacks and sugar and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And it's been a really successful program um, that we're looking to grow even more in the upcoming, up, upcoming year. Now tell me about your tax assistance program. Our tax assistance program is, has become, you know, we're ramping up right now because obviously tax season is coming very quickly. Um, we now do, we have about 14 sites. We work with our member agencies around the city. There are 14 sites around in every borough where we help families, low-income families, fill out their taxes. And we help them get their refunds. And annually, we bring in about $65 million a year. Um, in our next phase of the program, we've actually just started a new partnership with other charities, uh, groups like Dress for Success Worldwide, where we are uh, piloting a program with them so that they can even go out to their national network to help those women also take advantage of earned income tax credit programs. You know, I am uh, not a New Yorker by birth, and something that was just always bothered me, and I said, you know, when I first started this position, I think that just because you may live in Memphis or Birmingham, and maybe there's not a charity that's out there that's doing a program that really could help your family, you shouldn't be penalized for that. I think that when you are a leader in something, you owe the world uh, something uh, because of your expertise. So we've reached out to other charities to say, let's join together, let's partner. Uh, we have the assets, we want to train you, and we want you to get it out there to as many people who need these services because that money makes a major difference. I mean, average refund coming in, $1,300, $1,500. You know, your average American's emergency that really knocks them out is typically under $500. Yeah. So yeah. this is a game changer. Right. Um, according to a recent report, the federal government seems to be backsliding in, in its support for food programs. Yes. You know, and it's, 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 it's amazing, and yeah. I understand that they recently, the Senate is threatening to reduce food stamp benefits by $4.5 billion over 10 years, and we're, and we're in a recession. And you know? there's uh, 47 million Americans on the program, and it's growing, and that's not even all the people who are eligible. I think that this kind of thing happens. One of the worst things, I think, for food stamps is really bad PR. I think there's a stigma, not just about poverty, but about food stamps, um, and there are countless reasons why that stick. Are they exists. stamps now, or are they cards? They're, they're cards. cards. They're okay. cards. Snap. Okay, but we know them as food, food stamps, stamps, right? Um, horrible stigma. Everyone thinks it's those people. Well, no, forty-seven million people means it's someone you know. That's a lot of folks in New York City. That's one point eight million New Yorkers who are on food stamps, and we have not hit everyone who's eligible. So for me, I think the biggest problem is that we are allowing 
uh, stigma to pretend to be reality. Uh, food stamps requires advocacy. It requires every New Yorker, every American uh, becoming offended by the fact that anyone is hungry and that anyone, any American would be denied a program that not only works but has been found to have the least amount of fraud of any government program. And that's from the government. That's not Food Bank. That's not Margaret. That's the government saying that. So it's really about kind of sifting through the lies versus what's really true. And knowing at the end of the day, when people talk about folks living on food stamps, that too is not true. Average person on food stamps is only on it for about nine months. Makes sense since because of the recession, it typically takes you about 10 months to find a new job. And obviously they can't live on food stamps because they're, they're doing that and the food banks and food pantry is not enough to live on, right? It's not enough. And in New York City, we should become even more offended. You know, this city is expensive. All of us know that. Even if you are not a part of the three million who are struggling, you know it is expensive to live here. And you it, go to the supermarket and you come back with one bag and it <laughs> costs you 50 bucks. And it costs you 50 bucks. And you have to be back in that store in about two days. Right, exactly. I mean, that is the reality. <clears throat> you know. What has happened with the recession is that incomes have gone down, but the cost of living has gone up. Specifically, the cost of food has gone up. Um, so it's really just about us dealing with reality. Um, you know, listen, we don't give people extra credit for being a good person because they are wealthy, and we should not subtract credit for being a good person because you don't have money. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, it's not right, and it's not, it's not American. Well, it's been a very interesting discussion, and uh, you've got your work cut out for you, I obviously. Do. I do. We're out of time. I want to thank Margaret Purvis of the Food Bank for New York City for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about the Food Bank or would like to contribute in any way, go to their website, foodbanknyc.org, for more information. For the City, University of New York, and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>